so um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, this is, uh, I think, the fourth of our monthly, so far, uh, Ask Nature Spot sessions, uh, where we talk about recent observations from Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, and uh, we hope that you will submit all of your records, all of your interesting finds, and indeed the less interesting ones as well. If you're in Leicestershire and Rutland, uh, please could you submit them via the NatureSpot website, uh, naturespot.org.uk, and that way they go into the uh, county records as well. If you're outside of Leicestershire and Rutland, elsewhere in the UK, uh, watching the video on YouTube, for example, please submit them via the iRecord system at this address, because NatureSpot uh, only deals with uh, records from Leicestershire and Rutland. So, um, um, we've had a number of inquiries uh, sent in, um, and the first one is from Martin. And Martin observed this uh, insect that you can see um, in these photos, and he wanted to know uh, what it is. Um, and actually, you, this is a bit. This is going to be a bit of a theme this evening. Um, it's quite a common uh, uh, question, so it gives us an opportunity to talk about something. But before we get to that, um, the plant that the insect is on, Sue Timms tells me, is, it, is indeed buckthorn. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sue, or add anything you want to add. Uh, buckthorn's not particularly common in VC55. So Martin, it, it would be good to get a record for uh, the plant uh, as well as the insect. So the question is, what is the insect? What type of insect is the insect? There are two uh, insects flying around in abundance at the moment. There are sawflies and there are um, these solitary wasps, ichneumon wasps. And <clears throat> how do you tell the difference between them? Well, the easiest way of telling the difference between them is that if it's a wasp, it will have a waist. So between the, the thorax and the abdomen, there will be a pinched in region, uh, which um, uh, is um, uh, in a narrow, looks like a narrow waist. If it's a sawfly, it doesn't have that. The body is sort of continuous um, all the way down from, from, from the, the thorax to the tip of the abdomen. Now, if it's a sawfly, the other thing that's worth looking at um, is, uh, whether, is, is the plant that the sawfly is on, uh, because that very often can give you quite a good clue as to the species. So um, uh, this is not my area of strength. So I'm going to hand over to someone now to, who's going to bail me out and <laughs> and identify this insect. What, what do we think it is? Do we think it's a sawfly or do we think it's an ichneumon? Dave, what do you think? Well, it, it's definitely an ichneumon. Um, you can see the waste on it. Um, also, um, there are quite a few ichneumon wasps that look quite similar to this. We've got a few of them on Nature Spot. This whole group uh, of ichneumons, unfortunately, is is a bit of a black hole in terms of trying to identify them. There isn't anybody locally that uh, we would say uh, is an expert in these areas. And indeed, nationally, uh, there's a relatively few people that, that, that have really looked into them. One of the few um, is a chap called Gavin Broad, who works at the Natural History Museum. And he actually is, is pretty good at responding to queries. So I often suggest to people that they email the Natural History Museum. They have a, I can't remember what the email address is, but if you Google it, they, they have a dedicated email address. I think it's inquiries at or something like that. Um, if you want something identified, sometimes you have to wait a while, um, but hopefully you might get a response. Now the, the, the museum, have produced a guide, a beginner's guide to human wasps. So uh, perhaps if I just share my screen, I can I can show you to sure. show you it. I can find it. So the, the guide's available via 
nature spot. It is. So yes, if you go to the um, the ID resources uh, link on, under recording and information and look under bees and wasps, you'll find a link to this. So this is about the only uh, publication to British ignumens that, that there is around. There's no popular guide uh, at all. You sometimes will find odd ignumens covered in a, a, an all around insect guide, but they're not particularly reliable. Uh, this is pretty good um, in, in terms of giving you a starting point. Um, if we just scroll through uh, to the possibilities um, for it. Um, this was one I thought of. Uh, one of the key um, characteristics in the photo is that it has bands on the antennae and not many species uh, seem to have that. Um, but you've also got to be careful in that the males and the females can be quite different. So here's a good example. Um, you see the female has bands on the antennae, but the male doesn't. And indeed, in some species, the males and females look quite different altogether, different colours. However, I don't think it's this one, uh, Ignumen stramentor, because the first and second uh, tergites of the abdomen are all yellow in this species, and there is a black band, I think, on the second tergite in, in the photo. Um, it was suggested that it might be this one. Um, but again, I don't think it is because of the, the extra black band. Um, also, if you read the note here, it says um, that there are uh, perhaps 50 species, 50 British species in this one genus alone. <laughs> and they all look very similar. So uh, perhaps it's, it's not surprising that nobody you know, is brave enough to, to dive in and try and learn them all. Um, so I think the, 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 the bottom line is we can't say for certain other than it's an ignumen. Sorry. <laughs> if it, so Christine has shared the um, email address uh, in the uh, chat window. So the email address is bug at nhm.ac.uk. So by all means, have a go. Um, they will be deluged with inquiries at this time of year, of course. It's the, uh, it's the busiest time of year for these things, lots of these things on the wing um, at the moment. And um, don't be surprised if you, if you get a reply saying, uh, we can only identify it from a specimen, we can't do it from a photograph. So they, they are a very difficult group of insects. So um, might be a tricky one. Can, can we tell if it's a male or a female? Uh, well, females have a pointed abdomen, uh, but I don't think that's reliable necessarily. It's one of those, if you've got the two together, you might see a difference, but I'm personally not familiar with them enough to, to really say. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, w I would say Gavin Broad might be able to tell whether it's a male or a female, but I'm not sure I can. Is the answer to that. Anyway, we've narrowed it down. We've narrowed it down to Ignumon. So that only gives you a thousand or so possibilities. I don't know, you know, because it's a lot of these really, it's not one of the really tiny, teeny tiny ones. However, we are 100% confident that this is Buckthorn. So please, can you send in your Buckthorn record, Martin? Because that would be useful. So we, we, there we go. We've got something out of that one. Sorry, we couldn't be more helpful on that one. Um, and then uh, we'll go on to um, Ed and Elspeth. Ed uh, 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 found this fantastic. Uh, again, another solitary wasp. This is a really good example. We were talking about a waste. Well, not, not all Hymenoptera have a waste which is ext as extreme as this, um, but um, uh, it, it does make the point, I think. Uh, and the other thing that makes the point uh, is the uh, extremely extended ovipositor. Um, so these things, uh, this is actually, uh, it, it's actually a wood drill. They actually drill um, into uh, wood to uh, lay their eggs. So it's got a kind of a drill bit at the end of it, uh, and it and it drills its way in. 
um, looking, I think, for um, grubs. I, do you know? Do you know what they parasitize, Dave? Does that that there's some something within the wood that they parasitize? It's mainly larva, um, beetle larva, or caterpillars. Each species tends to concentrate on a different group. Yeah, so they've got they've got a reach a reach of about a, an inch or so through solid wood to reach a larva. So, but I, I presume they listen for the sound of the of the larva moving uh, or chomping its way through uh, the wood, and then drill through the wood and lay their eggs. So, um, ab absolutely spectacular things, and it's I think probably worth pointing out because I I've had this conversation with a couple of people this week. Um, completely harmless to humans, unless I suppose you are made out of wood. If you had a wooden leg, I suppose you might be at some risk. But other, other than that, absolutely harmless to humans. So um, yeah, uh, no, no risk of that. So, and I suspect that this, this wood, this piece of wood that it's on, looks as though it's been treated with preservative at some point. So I suspect it won't be, it won't be drilling into that either. So na natural wood. So, but yeah, fantastic insect, uh, and and just one of thousands of uh, solitary wasps. Um, it's the the yellow jackets, the social wasps that get all of the attention. But but really, there are there are so many of these. Uh, that uh, and, and some of them are very spectacular. An awful lot of them, it has to be said, are extremely small. Um, so uh, uh, that doesn't make them any easier to, uh, to um, uh, identify. But this is one of the big ones uh, and, and, and definitely worth looking out for. So that was a nice find. Now the second one, uh, another wasp, um, a bit trickier though this one. Um, so I'm out of my depth again. I'm going to hand this one back to Dave again instantly. Well, I think as it was suggested, it's a, a digger wasp, a sand digger wasp. Um, I think we can probably say uh, what the genus is. I think it's Sectemnius, um, but there's quite a few different species in that genus. And it's a, a microscope job to be to tell them apart, I'm afraid. They're the very, the very nice insects. They're very characteristic, uh, uh, sorry, charismatic insects. You do see a lot of photographs of these online. The macro photographers uh, like these because they've got this alien face with the mm. uh, hugely the uh, enlarged yeah. eyes. Um, um, but as yeah, to the mandible. exact species, um, I don't think we've got these set up as a species aggregate, have we, Dave? Not uh, as an aggregate, no. No, so um, it, it, this, this, this is just going to have to be one of the ones that got away. I mean, I think you would have to take a specimen and send it off to an expert to get it identified. Um, locally, um, uh, Steve Woodward or Helen Ilkin are good with wasps, uh, but they would definitely need a specimen. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do it from a photograph. So, uh, and, I, and I suspect it's not worth emailing this one to the NHM either because um, it, it, it is, as Dave says, it's a, it's a microscope job, possibly even a dissection job, I don't know. So um, very, very nice insect, but not, not the easiest. All of these wasps are quite tricky, really. Um, and then, sorry, sorry can you I... can ask a question. Yes, Sue. Uh, I've lost my, how to raise my hand. I don't know why, but anyway, okay. um, you, if you want to identify a solitary wasp, this book, which is a tiny little book, is quite useful. It really does have a workable key in it. Um, it's quite old now, but it's, it is reprinted and I, uh, it, it also is relatively cheap. So um, I've been surprised at how um, useful the key is. So uh, I would strongly recommend it to anyone to, I, I think it costs £14.99 or something. What, what's, the, what's the author say? It's um, Peter Yeo and Sarah Corbett. Sorry, there you go. I'll, I'll put the details on the chat thingy. You didn't know we had it? No. Brilliant, thanks. Yeah, well, your oh, book shelves oh, there are bursting <laughs> behind you, Ed, there, so, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so you can, you can give it a go, but it's not an easy genus. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it might be a bit tricky. Okay, and then uh, the third one um, is um, this one. Uh, and once again, uh, not one I'm familiar with. This it, is, it, is, it's is another ignuman. Is this on a rhododendron? 
Looks like it's on a rhododendron, is that right? It's on a hebe. Oh, it's a hebe, okay. Yeah. I even got the plant wrong. Uh, Dave. <laughs> Well, again, we, we, it's, a, it's an ichneumon wasp. Um, I had a look through that beginner's guide that the Natural History Museum have produced, and uh, this one isn't in it. So uh, it's certainly not a beginner's ichneumon wasp. Um, again, I, I, we just can't really say. It, it, you could send this one off to uh, the Natural History Museum, and it's possible. It, I noticed it's got uh, very stripy back legs, um, the, the tarsi are quite noticeably striped. That might be a feature, but I don't know enough of, of the whole group to, to really hazard a guess. It, it, it's not one I recognize, uh, but but it, yeah, it, it may be worth sending this one off to that um, email address. If you go to, um, um, uh, um, to bug at nhm.ac.uk, uh, yep. As as Dave says, those hind uh, tarsi might might give them a clue, but um, uh, I, I don't know. They're, they're, they're really a difficult group. Or oh, Sue, well, I don't know. Is it, is it in your book, Sue? So, <laughs> wasps with stripy hind legs. I don't know. You well, you've got the book, Ed, so you can. Oh, it's well. Doesn't have any pictures in it. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it. It just covers what it doesn't cover. It even this book. Uh, okay. Um, wasp, but it covers um, the, the uh, like the digger wasps and the um, a lot of the black and yellow ones are in there. Which um, and the, the key is weird, but it works. Um, so I quite like it. And Steve Woodward thinks it's okay as well, which is helpful. Great, Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. So we, we, we didn't do very well with those, I'm afraid, Ed, so sorry, but you, you did you did pick some difficult ones there. So, um, you yeah, know, that, that, that's a bit above our pay grade, really. They are they are a very difficult group of insects, the ichneum ones. Uh, um, so that brings us to uh, an easy, a slightly easier one uh, from Christine. So uh, you, she, she asked, uh, is it a scorpion fly? And, or she thought it was a scorpion fly, and, in, and indeed it is a scorpion fly. Um, uh, but um, uh, I don't think we can say which species it is. Um, I think it's a female, isn't it, Dave? It's definitely a female. Um, they, they're called scorpion flies because the male has a, a genital capsule that kind of wraps over the, from the, the tip of the abdomen, it wraps over the back and does look like a scorpion sting. Uh, they're completely harmless, I, I hasten to add. Um, yeah, the females have the, the, the pointed abdomen, as you can see here. There are three species in the UK. Um, I think only two of them uh, we've got records for in, in Leicestershire, communists and uh, Panopa communists and Panopa germanica. I think. Um, they look exactly the same. Um, so you couldn't tell just looking at this picture which one it is. Um, the, you can tell them apart uh, if you're prepared basically to dissect them. The males you can just about tell apart visually if you've got a really good picture. Um, the, the key thing to look at is on, on the male, the, where the, the genital capsule wraps over the, the tip of the abdomen it has two valves on the top and um, it's the shape of those those valves and you can just about see them with a, a good macro shot and if you look on on the species pages on nature sport it explains the differences between the two of them yeah so look up scorpion fly on uh, nature spot and, and we do as they've said we do have pictures but unfortunately with the females, we can't identify them. So, so we can, again, we can tell you the genus, it's Panorpa, it's a scorpion fly, uh, it's harmless, uh, quite common at this time of year, particularly in woodland. I tend to see them in woodland mostly, um, but um, uh, um, uh, try and find a male. Uh, go back to the same location. I don't know where you found it. See if you can find a male. Uh, and yeah. then you might be able to work out which uh, species it is. This is this is a common thing. Um, I've been doing I've been doing a lot of leaf hoppers in the last month or so, and again the females are very difficult, if not impossible, to tell apart. 
and uh, I've, I've had the frustration several times of having quite a number of specimens I've brought home and they all turn out to be female because they're only they're only three or four millimeters long and working out whether they're male or female in the field is, is pretty hard so um, you need to get them under the microscope so um, there's a lot of things that are, that are like that the male genitalia very often are used for identification um, uh, it's one of the nice things about spiders you can look at males or females for the mm -hmm. most part um, but uh, so yes it's a scorpion fly uh, go and try and find a male that would be our advice because then then you might be okay. able to identify if you look, <laughs> look very very carefully at the tail but look at the photographs on nature spot first and you'll you'll, you'll see what you're looking for it's the the lump at the end of the tail the orange lump yeah I did do that I've looked at um, I found a few this summer of these but I think they must have been males um, they were a bit easier but this one was smaller as well. As Dave says, if you get a good photograph of it, uh, yeah. you, you, you can tell them apart. Um, but um, uh, not the females, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. So that with this our, our rubbish run of not identifying anything <laughs> continues this evening. Sorry about that. And so now here's one we here's one we, we did earlier. Uh, so Sue, uh, this afternoon I think, found this mystery object in her back garden. So, I did. So, which I managed to misidentify for her. Well, I, I thought it was a, a hoverfly, but I wasn't very happy. Uh, it was sitting on a, a knapweed leaf. So I sent it to a few people and um, David Gould, who's one of the nature spot trustees and a really good all-round naturalist um, identified it for me as um, the larva of the tortoise beetle um, Cassida I don't know if people know that it's, um, it's about five six millimeters long and a sort of perfect dome shape perfectly leaf green um, insect uh, really beautiful um, but I've never seen this before the, the really sad thing was though that when I saw it there was a blob of um, sort of uh, well, it looked like a dropping sat on top of it. So I tenderly brushed this away um, so that I could photograph it, only for David to tell me that it actually put it there deliberately to give it some camouflage. Um, so I've destroyed its camouflage, completely blown its cover, the process. And I just went out to look at it and it's still sitting on the leaf, um, very sadly. <laughs> so, um, but um, amazing structure with those little feathery bristles around the edges. Very nice. So, the, uh, the dropping is normally perched on those two um, uh, sort of projections at the tail end. So I, I think we've got two species of Cassida in VC55. Is that right, Dave? Do you know? Two? No, there's more. I think there's more than I think, two. I think there's about six. Right. Okay. And they're not they're not easy to tell apart as adults. So I think they're the not larvae, They're not impossible either. Um, no, no, but but I but think the larvae mm. are, are probably a step too far. I suppose you could rear it out, Sue. I suppose since you've annoyed it, you could pop the leaf in a jar and 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 rear it out, safe from predators. And then when mm. it when it's an adult, you could probably identify it. I could probably do that. I'm I'm terrible at killing things if I try and do that. I just um, right. go back to them and find that they've. Uh, dried out or gone mouldy, so I am really rubbish at this, actually. No, I, 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 I find rearing things difficult <laughs> as well as, as you say, that you are, they're either too dry or too wet, and no. it's not, not straightforward. You've got to have a very nurturing mind to be able to do it. But, um, I guess it's about practice, but I, I do wish I didn't have so many victims, really. <laughs> um, but I might do that. It's a good idea. Um, we can't go any further than Cassida. The, the other the other way that people rear things is they, they they rear them in situ so they'll put some sort of sleeve over or cage over the over the leaf or the branch that something is on uh, so that's sort of the lazy man's way of, of doing it and and that can be quite effective that's quite an effective way of of rearing butterflies from caterpillars for example um, just put a, you just put a cage over the whole plant or over the branch or whatever it might be and uh, and just let them uh, get, you know uh, exist in their natural environment 
Um, so it's not a lot of work and it, and it, and it does work uh, quite well. So um, uh, you do wind up with your garden festoon with lots of sort of nylon curtains and things like that. But uh, well, you can't have everything, can you? So um, there you go. yeah, cat tortoise beetle. Again, another good one to look up on Nature Spot. Very, very attractive beetles, very interesting beetles. So uh, here's one that we can identify to species level. I, I, I put this uh, up because this came up uh, in the last week. Uh, new species, as you see, new species of moth for Leicestershire and Rutland, uh, cypress pug. And I believe this has now turned up twice uh, within the last week. Um, and so um, uh, any of you who run a moth trap or even if you're out just looking around, um, uh, worth looking out for this one. Um, uh, I, I find pug moths very difficult to identify in general. Uh, but this one is pretty distinctive. The pattern on the wings of this one is, 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 is fairly easy to recognize. So uh, we've got, uh, as I said, I think there are two VC55 records now. As you can see, uh, we are sort of right on the, the northern edge of the distribution of, uh, of this moth. Uh, probably it is extending its range as so many are. Um, but you can expect, therefore, probably more of these to be to be turning up uh, in uh, future years. But we've had two in the last uh, week, so uh, definitely worth uh, keeping your eye out for uh, cypress pug. Quite a nice moth, one of the more attractive pug moths, dare I suggest, and one that we can finally identify to species level. So uh, that's enough from uh, me. Um, so, Dave, uh, I think you had some things to share as well. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to share my screen. So, um, we get quite a lot of uh, emails from um, not just from Leicester and Rutland, but from all over the UK, and indeed, as I mentioned before, from other parts of the world. Um, people just clearly seen the website and, and, and send all sorts of photos in asking for, for identification. And, and this arrived uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the email didn't say where it was from. And uh, I don't know whether you recognize uh, this, but it's uh, the Roman snail. Uh, sometimes called the edible snail and it's the largest snail in Britain indeed the largest snail in in northern Europe um, but it's not found in Leicestershire so I just assumed that the email would have been from down south in the Chilterns or or, or wherever it's normally found and uh, and so I asked the person out of interest where they were from and uh, hey presso they were from East Leek in Nottinghamshire, which is only just over the border, which was quite intriguing because, I say, it's a, a southern, southerly species. And uh, so I, I checked on the, um, the, the, the Leicester and Rutland uh, Records Office database, Orca, and there's no records of it in Leicestershire. So I sent the record off to a friend of mine who uh, is interested in mollusks in Nottinghamshire. And he checked too, and there's no record in Nottinghamshire. So that seems a, a bit of a mystery. Um, however, when I looked on the MBN um, and you zoom in on their map, the, there is a dot in the centre of Leicester and another one um, just uh, near the Rutland border. And uh, th although these aren't included in the uh, Leicester and, and, and Rutland Record Office database, but I think what is probably happening maybe with these records and also with the one in East Leek is that um, because uh, they are eaten, um, you can actually buy them live on the internet for cooking purposes. And I suspect that's what's happened and one or two have escaped. It was also found in a garden and it's certainly not a garden species, but um, an intriguing find nevertheless. Um, and then a couple of other mollusks which I thought I'd share with you. 
Um, these have been submitted to NatureSpot in the last uh, week or two by uh, by Min Bell, you know, keen NatureSpot recorder, and uh, she lives out in the west of the county and has been exploring the Ashby Canal, which is a, a great uh, place to go uh, nature spotting, if you're not familiar with it. The northern part of it is a, a triple SI. And I think they must have been doing some maintenance work. And she found these shells in some debris that had been hauled out of the canal. And um, she wasn't sure what they were, but uh, as you can see, uh, she, she did the right thing and sent a picture both of the um, the outside of the shell and the inside of the shell with uh, bivalves, that's really important. And again, really usefully gave an idea of size, which uh, allowed me to um, be, be sure that it's the zebra mussel. Um, it normally uh, lives up to its name and has these kind of black stripes on it. Um, uh, but it's also uh, very variable in its in its shape. In fact, you should know that really, if, if you know your Latin from its Latin name, polymorpha, you know, multiple shaped. So sometimes it can be quite triangular, as the picture at the bottom here is, and other times it can be kind of banana shaped. Um, so it's sometimes a little bit tricky to, to be sure. Um, it's actually been around in the country a long time. It was first um, found in the in, in Britain in the 1820s, so 200 years. Um, and it has only recently, though, become more widespread. And it's a real pest species. Um, there are quite a lot of records of it now in Leicestershire. And I've known for a while it's, uh, it's in Rutland water. And um, I think Anglian water have a big problem with it because one of the reasons it's a, it's a problem is it gets into water treatment works and into the pipes. And uh, they, uh, the, the, the new um, mollusks secrete themselves to anything that's, uh, that's kind of firm and hard would, would provide them with the secure substrate. And that includes other zebra mussels. And so you imagine over time, they just keep piling on top of each other. And if they're in a pipe, not, it's not too long before the pipe gets blocked. The other interesting thing about the zebra mussel is that the larva are very sensitive to ultraviolet light. So when they settle, any that are too near the surface die. And so you get a, a very clear cut line about a meter down where there's no zebra mussels above that height, um, and then they can get very dense below. And then um, just a few days later, uh, Min also uh, submitted another bivalve that she found in the Ashby Canal. Uh, again, in a different place, this one, but um, I think it's come from some, some, some clearance work. And this is another invasive species. Uh, this is the uh, Asian clam. Now this one has been around a much shorter period of time and it's not widely recorded in Leicestershire at all. I think this is the, uh, it's only the second record that I know of, but uh, I noticed on uh, on here, there's a, this, this yellow square up near Loughborough is from the MBN. And so there's another record of it that uh, hasn't come through nature sport. And it has a very similar tendency to the zebra mussel in that it builds up um, populations and blocks pipes and, and water treatment works. But, uh, you know, as invasive species, it's quite useful um, for us to track the spread of these, and particularly this one, as it's relatively new to the county. I suspect now it's here, it, uh, the evidence elsewhere suggests that it will expand fairly rapidly, unfortunately. It's fairly easy to identify this one. It's um, got this kind of greeny yellow colour, and it's very deeply ribbed, as you can see up here in the top left. But you're not likely to come across it um, in the water as it lives you know, at depth. So if ever you see, both in a river or canal, any works where they've been clearing out the sediment at the bottom, do go have a look through and uh, take pictures of any shells that you could find, because it's one of the best ways to, to record what's there. Uh, and, and another changing the kind of taxon group and, and another interesting um, or interesting to me <laughs> um, 
species to look at is one of the commonest flies around at the moment. If you go out, outside for a walk, you, you can, you'll see literally hundreds of, of these, these green bottles. And um, it, it, it's always a bit frustrating that when you get a really common species, they can be very hard to, uh, to pin down exactly what they are. The commonest one of these green bottles is Lucilia sericata. Um, and the great majority of the ones that you see will be this species. Um, so I thought I'd switch to a, a better picture that will illustrate some of the, the key features. Now there are eight Lucilia species. So how do we know um, we're looking at sericata? Well, like everything, if you know what to look for, it's not that difficult. So uh, it might be a bit niche for some, but uh, <laughs> I thought I'd just quickly summarize the key features. Uh, unfortunately, it involves a little bit of terminology that uh, comes with, with flies, but it's quite useful to have a kind of a brief introduction to this because you'll see these words quite commonly. Um, the first thing I think just to bear in mind is there are other kind of green shiny flies around. Um, and they're not all in the same family. There are tachinids, uh, muscids, uh, as well as califorids like Lucilia. And so an easy way to tell them apart is, um, is by the venation on the wings. And this long vein here at the bottom, it's called uh, vein M. And in the califorids, um, this is the blowflies, you know, blue bottles, green bottles, um, it, um, it has quite a sharp kink, as you can see there. And we'll, we'll see in a minute when we look at uh, another similar species, a, a muscid, it does, it, it's quite different. So once you're sure it's a, a califorid, and normally they're pretty easy to, to tell because they have this very high sheen, very, very glossy uh, green, whereas most of the others are, are not as glossy. And so the, the first feature you're asked to look at is the Basicosta. Now I really struggled with this when I, I, I read this about this feature. I thought, what on earth is the Basicosta? And it was quite hard to, to pin down. And it's, it, the, the, the key said it's at the base of the wing. Um, but which bit of the base of the wing is it that we're looking at? Well, the easiest way I find to remember it is if you think of like a, an epaulette, that uh, you know, a, a soldier or somebody would have, or, or, or a policeman would have on their shoulders. It's like a little bit of a flap that sits on the shoulders. So, if you look for this kind of little flap on the uh, right at the top of the shoulder of the wing, that's the basicosta. And of the eight species of Lucilia, only two of them have a pale basicosta. All the other six have dark uh, basicostas. So, once you've you've seen that it's pale. And it's fairly clear to see. If you've got a, a, a microscope, it's very easy. Even with a lens, you can pick it out. And, and quite often in a macro photo, you can see it too. So then you've immediately narrowed it down to two species, Sericato and Richard's eye. And I've never seen Richard's eye, so I don't know uh, how common it is. I don't think it's very common at all. So once you've seen the, the, the pale basicosta, it's very likely to be Sericata. But how do you prove it? So then you have to look at another feature. And uh, the key uh, point to look at here is the, the, the seta, the, these bristles on, on its leg. With, with flies, the bristles on the legs um, are really important. And um, this one is specific to the mid tibia. So this is the middle segment of the mid leg. And it's, uh, the anterior dorsal seta and uh, sericata only has a single bristle. So just to try and help you through the fog of all these terms, and anterior means um, towards the front, obviously opposite to posterior. If it was posterior, the, uh, the, the spine or the bristle would be coming out the back here. And dorsal means it's on the top. So it's fairly logical. And when it's anterior dorsal, it means it's on the uh, on the angle between the two. So it's a kind of a it's it's sticking partly forward and sticking partly up. Um, and it's it's fairly straightforward to see once once you've got the the specimen in front of you. So those two features alone tell me it's definitely seri 
sericata. So you've got the pale basic cluster and the single seater on the mid uh, tibia. Um, there are uh, other features that some keys say, but some keys don't mention them. And these relate to the lines of bristles or seater on the, on the thorax. Now, most flies have these four regular rows of bristles. So it's kind of useful if you're going to look at flies, kind of getting your head around these because they're used very commonly for identification. And they have very strange names. Um, the two central runs are called the acrostical seater. And then the two outside of those are the dorsocentral. It seems um, a bit perverse because you think the dorsocentral would be in the middle, wouldn't you? But it's not. Um, so you just it's just bits of terminology you've got to remember. And, and the other thing is, if you look on the um, thorax, you'll see there's a line right across the middle. That's called the suture. So it's especially two different plates on the on the thorax, and you count the bristles in front of that suture and also behind. So that's what these numbers refer to. So the two plus three means there's two bristles on the acrostickles, which is the the middle ones before the suture, and then the three afterwards, and then the dorsal central seater. Um, it's three and three, and you can just see here there's three bristles in front of the suture and, and three behind. So subtle differences and quite fine details, but once you know it, then you should be able to identify um, this species. And as I say, you could, you could go out in the morning probably, well, maybe not tomorrow morning when there's 50 mile an hour gales, but <laughs> most days you could go out with a net and, and within half an hour, you could probably catch a hundred of these. So coming back to my terrible picture, um, but actually it was just about good enough to help me identify it. So even on this um, fairly blurry picture, you can see the pale basicosti. See how it stands out on the base of the wing? Um, and then on, on here, I was able to, to count the bristles. So um, on the acrostickles in the middle, um, two in front of the suture and three behind. And then on the dorsal central, um, there's three behind. You can't see the third very clearly, but it's right up near the collar. Um, it's easier with uh, if you look at it under a microscope. So you can see it's it's three and three. And I checked the mid tibia as well just to be sure. So then I, I could record it. So it's surprising for probably what is one of the commonest, if not the commonest, fly we have in Leicestershire there are relatively few records for it because people don't know what the features are to, to identify it. But now I've told you, we'll have hundreds of records, I'm sure, in the next few days. Um, just very quickly to finish with, in terms of uh, other species you might confuse it with, um, the, there are a couple of muskids that are also bright, shiny green. Um, this one, I'm. I'm not familiar with, but it um, has this kind of green uh, fronds. The fronds is the kind of front of the head. So that's all shiny like the rest of the, the fly. And that's not the case on Lucilia. Um, there's a tachinid, that's the different family tachinids of these flies that are parasites of, um, of other insects. And they tend to be very bristly. And you can see on this one, on uh, Gymnikita viridis, very bristly. This isn't uncommon, um, but it's mainly a spring species. And um, I, I saw quite a few earlier this year. But the one, the other one that is also very common at the moment is this one, Eudocyphora cyanella. So it's not um, a <coughs> califorid, it's a muscid. So if you remember that vein M at the tip of the wing, it had that almost 90 degree kink in it in the califorids. This one's just got a smooth curve. And the other kind of key feature to look at is this, the pale collar with the two black stripes at the very front of the thorax. It's also worth saying that um, although it's a bit, a bit variable, it's much bluer. It's not a shiny, glossy green as Lucilia. And um, once you kind of get your eye in, they're quite easy to tell apart. So these two species are 
very, very common at the moment. So that's my, my day's hunt over with. Thanks, Dave. Um, we, there's a couple of questions for you in the uh, chat window, uh, if you've seen those. I haven't. Let me just um, bring it up. So one's going back to the mollusks, uh, asking about what effect the, these invasive mollusks have on uh, native fauna. I, I have read that uh, particularly the Asian clam is bad news for native mollusks because it, it outcompetes them basically. Um, fortunately, in Leicestershire, they're not sufficiently widespread for us to, to have seen that, but um, I, I, I've not experienced that myself, but that's what I've read. Um, I don't know, I imagine the same is probably true of the zebra mussel just because it, it, they accumulate in such dense populations and they, they just kind of pile on top of each other, sticking, sticking together. Um, and that will include, you know, things like swan mussels, duck mussels, any stones, anything that's hard and could provide a base substrate. These uh, very aggressive mussels will stick themselves to and they'll just smother other, other species. And there was a there was another one about uh, the um, hairs on the um, uh, on on the flies, but I think maybe yes, you went on the, and explained that with the diagrams. Yeah, they are symmetrically placed. A few flies don't have all of the rows, though. So not and, and indeed this is often a key feature to look for. The acrostichals, the central two rows, are sometimes missing altogether, and and a few uh, types of flies don't have any hairs at all on, on them, but whether they are there, yes, they tend to be in like rail, railway uh, tracks and, and quite symmetrical. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, hopefully uh, we will get some more mollusk records. Go follow the um, British Waterways crews around when they're clearing out the sediment from the uh, canals and uh, have a good look. <clears throat> Go catch some flies, possibly not tomorrow, as Dave said. <laughs> Um, uh, so th did anyone else want to share anything this evening? So um, uh, we've, we've seen your uh, beetle larva, um, uh, but um, we're going to hold on to um, your goals until next week. Was there anything else? Um, I've, got, um, I've got a couple of fly mines that I found. I'm sorry, they're not, um, I don't know if people are very interested in fly mines, but I've become Quite addicted to looking at them so I can show people those it'll only take a few minutes if that's okay with everyone let's continue the fly theme yeah okay I'll share my screen then um, okay can everyone see that all right yeah okay so um, I've, I've actually got three here the, the first one is um, this is a, a fly uh, in the agromyzid family um, and it was found on common reeds. So the, at the top of the um, slide, you can see um, the actual mine in the leaf. I've then sort of um, honed in on the bit where I can just see the puparium. The, the little black thing is called, it's not a pupa, it's a puparium. It's actually made out of the um, final skin of the larva, just as it um, develops into, as it starts to pupate. Um, and it, you can see in this particular one, it's a shining black. It, it's also a very distinctive shape for um, a fly puparium. Um, the little structures at the, um, at the front and the rear end are used to help it breathe, and they're part of the breathing apparatus. And sometimes the little prongs on the, on the left-hand side of that one there um, actually protrude through the skin of the plant, the epidermis of the plant. Um, and, and help it actually um, take in air to to, um, um, uh, to help it breathe, presumably. So um, this this isn't the first county record; it's the second one. Uh, we've got one other record for it, which is also in Lutterworth, um, actually in Risterton Marshes. Um, so I suspect it may be in in other beds of common reed around, and particularly maybe in the south of the county. Um, definitely worth looking for. Um, if you do look for it, you need to make sure you've got the, the puparium to look at. 
um, I find that um, with a lot of the fly mines, it's not enough just to have the mine itself. You often need to be look at the look at uh, a little bit more detail. And as ever with um, fly mines, if you put them on nature spot, um, they'll be looked at by the national expert um, Barry Warrington, who's um, uh, very very helpful. And he, he also, if you want to email him any. Um, photos he'll also look at them and he will look at specimens as well if he feels that um, you know they're unusual enough. So that was my first one. Um, the second one is um, it's actually a very very common moth um, called Epimenia chorophyllella. It's a ridiculous name really isn't it? Um, it's, it's not very often recorded. I don't think it comes to light very often, but um, we, it, it is probably quite common in the county. What I hadn't realised is that it actually makes some um, leaf mines. Um, so this is a cow parsley leaf that the um, that has been comprehensively mined by the caterpillars. Um, and after a while, they do give up living in a mine, which, as you know, is uh, is where they feed between the upper and lower surface of the plant leaf. And they go around to um, feeding externally and, and basically eating um, the plant down to a skeleton. Um, so it, it's worth looking for. Um, it may help to increase records for this. I had, when I got home from Thornton Reservoir, I actually found it in my garden. I wasn't aware of that. And I had never um, found it in my moth trap either. Um, so um, I'm now looking for this everywhere. Um, my final one, which is a first county record, um, this is um, also a fly in the agromyzid family. Um, this one lives on Great Burnet saxifrage, um, which is uh, it's having a good year this year. It's, it's quite, there's quite a lot of it about on roadside verges, a really attractive um, tall umbellifer, uh, very pure white flowers. Um, the thing I rather liked about this one is that you can see very clearly um, the feeding lines caused by the lava inside the mine as it sort of swings its head in an arc shape from side to side. It leaves these sort of little semicircular lines um, in there. Um, I'm afraid that that, that blob, dog blob is the pupa, puparium, um, but when I opened it, it had been parasitized um, and was clearly, um, it was just mushy inside, um, possibly I suppose by one of the Nick Newman that we looked at earlier. Um, I, I only found one mine with a healthy lava in it, so um, this happens quite regularly when you're looking at mines that you, you open them or look at them closely and find that someone's got there first. Um, and it makes you realise, you know, what a, what a risky world it is out there for a lot of wildlife. You know, um, there's so many, was it 50 different species of Ignumon? suspiciosus or something like it. Um, you know, they're all got their sights on one um, poor unsuspecting insect or another. So that was all, Alan. I'll stop sharing now. That's great. Thank, thanks very much, Sue. Um, uh, did, did we, we're going to, we did say we would try and keep these uh, to about an hour, so we're coming up towards our hour. Is, is there anything that anyone else wanted to share this evening or ask about? No, well, we've seen some interesting species and, and thanks very much. Um, we, we will make this recording available uh, via the uh, Nature Spot uh, website. So thanks to everyone who's who shared and and, and also just just listened in uh, this evening.